You're watching live pictures from the United Nations General Assembly in New York, where Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong is about to address world leaders. Let's listen in. A quien invito a dirigirse a la Asamblea General. Invite him to address the General Assembly. As we approach the 75th anniversary of the United Nations next year, it's timely to reflect on the role of the UN and the relevance of multilateralism. Mm -hmm. okay. The open and integrated international order that emerged after the Cold War has benefited all countries. For small countries like Singapore, multilateral institutions, systems and laws are critical for our survival. These give us a stake in the global commons and a means to defend and to advance our interests. A rules-based system imposes responsibilities on all countries and creates a stable environment for all. And this is why Singapore is a staunch advocate of the United Nations, of international law and of the multilateral system. Now the world is going through a complex transition. The strategic balance is shifting. More countries are keen to enhance their international roles and are competing fiercely for influence. At the same time, the global consensus on the benefits of globalization has eroded and support for multilateralism has declined. In many countries, nationalist, isolationist and protectionist sentiments have intensified. These sentiments have reshaped their domestic politics and given rise to inward-looking nativist policies. And the result is a more polarized world. Continuing along this path will lead to an even more fragmented and unstable world. And yet, despite the increased friction and greater potential for conflict, countries have, in fact, become much more interconnected. Actions by one country are having a greater and faster impact on others and effects that may eventually redound upon themselves. In such a world, a multilateral approach is not an option, yeah. but a necessity to deal with complex global problems, including poverty eradication, pandemics, and climate change. These are some of the themes of this year's UN General Assembly debate. Sustainable development has become a priority for all countries. We all face common challenges, creating jobs, raising standards of living, and eradicating poverty. But it is very difficult for any country to develop and progress on its own. Growth requires trade, investments, and technology. And all of these activities depend on working with others within an open and orderly international framework of rules. And that has been how many countries have progressed in the last 70 years, since World War II. Developed countries opened up their own markets. In return, they benefited from access to new markets in the developing world for their industrial products, such as aircraft, electronic devices, and machine tools. China's accession to the World Trade Organization in 2001 presaged two decades of dramatic economic growth which lifted more than 850 million people out of poverty. India, too, has grown steadily since the 1990s as its economy gradually liberalized and became more enmeshed with its partners. Earlier, other smaller economies in East and Southeast Asia, including Singapore, traveled the same path. Now, many developing countries in Africa and Latin America are making the same journey. But if global markets become less open and conditions for trade and investment become more uncertain and disorderly, their progress will become much harder. Traditionally, developed countries help developing countries through foreign aid and technical assistance. But a much more effective way to help them is for developed countries to keep trade and markets open so that developing countries become more productive and can uplift standards of living on their own, providing good jobs at home without the pressure to emigrate to seek better lives elsewhere. Today, there's a strong pushback against an open, integrated global economy.
the view that globalization and free trade have worsened inequality has grown. But in truth, globalization and free trade have improved the lives of billions of people around the world, and not only those living in poor countries. Indeed, within each country, there have been winners and losers. And not all countries have succeeded in squaring off the benefits and the costs of globalization domestically. Then, the international system often becomes their scapegoat. But a fragmented world with less growth and prosperity will create fewer jobs and make everyone's prospects even dimmer. Worse, closed global markets will create tension and instability in the international system. This does not mean the, multila the multilateral system is working perfectly. Far from it. The post-war multilateral institutions have serious weaknesses. For example, the W Trade Organization has found it increasingly difficult to reach meaningful trade agreements when any deal requires full consensus among its 164 member countries with hugely diverse interests and philosophies. Furthermore, the WTO's rules were designed for an agriculture and manufacturing based world economy. And we now need new and better rules for services, particularly for digital services and intellectual property. But the solution should be to reform these institutions rather than to bypass or dispense with them without first putting in place a better answer. However, countries cannot afford to wait indefinitely for these reforms either. Meanwhile, new regional mechanisms and frameworks for cooperation are emerging or have developed. For instance, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP. These will lower barriers and raise standards for trade in goods and services. For finance, the Chiang Mai Initiative helps Asian countries to manage short-term liquidity problems via a multilateral currency swap arrangement and complement support from the IMF. These are practical ways for countries to work together to help one another through the vagaries of the global economy. Infrastructure development is another area ripe for regional cooperation. All over Asia, the demand for infrastructure far outstrips supply. Most of the time, governments can't fund all the infrastructure they need and international financial institutions like the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank do not have enough resources to go around either. And that's why new initiatives like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, or the United States BUILD Act have a role and are welcomed by many countries. These regional or plurilateral arrangements may be second best to multilateral ones, but in an imperfect world, they address real needs and help us progress step by step. The key is to keep these arrangements open and inclusive so that the arrangements can overlap and add to one another and allow other countries to join when they are ready. We need to avoid creating rival economic blocks or a bifurcated global economy, forcing countries to choose sides and undermining the international order. Multilateral cooperation is also essential to deal with wicked global problems. These are problems that no single country can solve alone, but which, if not tackled, will have disastrous consequences for all countries. One salient example is climate change. This is an issue that our young people are seized with, and rightfully so, because it is about their futures during their lifetimes. This week, Hundreds of thousands of young people demonstrated peacefully all over the world, including in Singapore, to demand climate action from their leaders. We owe them a responsibility to act, and they deserve our full support. On our part, Singapore takes climate change very seriously. Climate change is an existential issue for us. Like other low-lying island states, we are most vulnerable to rising sea levels. But we will suffer from its other effects too, whether it's new diseases 
more extreme weather events, food shortages, forced migration, or even wars. Being so small, Singapore contributes only 0.11% of global CO2 emissions. Furthermore, we are disadvantaged in alternative energy with limited sources of renewables other than solar energy. Nevertheless, we are committed to do our full share under the Paris Agreement to reduce emissions and mitigate global warming. We have implemented significant measures, including a carbon tax, which is the first in Southeast Asia, and which we apply economy-wide with no exemptions. We are working with the United Nations to offer technical assistance to other countries. We will collaborate with partners to improve our understanding of climate change and its impact through research and institutions like the ASEAN Specialized Meteorological Center, which is based in Singapore. We will also contribute to efforts by international organizations, such as the International Civil Aviation Organization and the International Maritime Organization, to reduce emissions. In this regard, I'd like to commend the UN Secretary General for convening the Climate Action Summit this week. It was both timely and necessary. Most importantly, we have to inculcate in our populations the mindset that each one of us has a responsibility to live sustainably and in harmony with the environment. We are under no illusions that the Paris Agreement target of 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming or less will be easy to achieve. And even if we do make it, the problem will not be completely solved because that will only slow down the rise in sea levels but will not stop it. But we must try our best, and over time, all countries will have to do more to mitigate climate change. At the same time, we must be serious about preparing early to adopt, adapt to climate change. Adaptation efforts will be costly, but they are an essential investment to protect not just our coastlines, but also our communities, our futures, and our very existence. It is the responsibility of our generation to leave future generations with a habitable planet, both through mitigation and adaptation. To adapt multilateralism for today's world calls for new approaches that are open, inclusive and transparent. As member states of the United Nations, we all have to work together to find solutions to global problems and build support for multilateral institutions amongst our people. A rules-based multilateral system is still far preferable to any other way to secure our peace and prosperity and to solve global problems. I call on my fellow UN member states to support the multilateral approach to push harder against the tide and demonstrate leadership in this endeavor. Thank you, Mr. President. And that was Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong speaking at the UN General Assembly in New York. It's the first time that Mr. Lee has attended the debate since becoming PM in 2004. Singapore joined the United Nations 54 years ago. Now Mr. Lee's address urged world leaders not to let up on multilateralism or abandon its institutions. Instead, he says these are ever more important in today's world when there's been a pushback from rising nationalist attitudes. Mr. Lee added that for small states like Singapore, multilateralism is critical for their survival since it gives them a platform to make their voices heard on global affairs. The multilateral approach is also the best way to deal with what Mr. Lee called wicked problems which are impossible to solve by a single country alone. And one such problem or the issue that's been the focus of the United Nations General Assembly this year is climate change. And he said that Singapore, a low-lying state, is facing the threat of rising sea levels. That's what he also talked about during the National Day rally. But it cannot go at it alone and we, we need all countries to do, to do their part. And it's, it's on its part, he pledged, that Singapore is going to continue to fight climate change and commit to the, the, what it agreed to at the Paris Agreement. Now, this is the first time making this commitment so openly on a global stage on what it's doing as a country. It's not only implemented a carbon tax this year, but Mr. Lee said Singapore will continue to work with others to understand climate change and its impact.